So um, don't feel shy to come to the microphone, inshallah. Brother at the male microphone, would you please state your name, your occupation, and please state your question briefly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Idris, I'm a businessman and also Dai. My question is that there are many non-Muslims in India as well as in the world. They are worshipping the natural things, natural elements. But in these scriptures of Hinduism, also the Bible, they mentioned about the prohibition of natural things. Like the Veda says that do not worship the natural things and also in Bible. But they worship. So the Jesus Christ, peace be upon said in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse number 30, Think not that I can my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. I seek not my own will, but will of my Father who has sent me. Please explain why these uh, non-Muslims worship these natural things. Please explain. Jazakallah. It was a very good question. One of the things I'd like to remind all of us about is... The, the difference between the Jew, the Christian, and the Muslim isn't that we worship different gods, but it's the way we look at God, it's the way we perceive God, it's our concept of God. And when there's no taqwa, regardless if it's a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, if there's no taqwa, then what do you expect? What do you expect from somebody who doesn't really follow their book anyway. Most likely in their heart they don't have the commitment, they don't have the Iman in it. So this is why they don't follow it. And this is true of anybody, regardless of what scripture it is, and even the Hindus. And I don't know anything about the Hindu scriptures other than what I learned from Dr. Zachar Naik. But they have commandments, they have orders of things that they're supposed to do and not do. And the people will do it only if it's convenient to them because very few people have taqwa. If you want to know why people are not guided, that's the exact reason. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, the very beginning, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim. Dalik al-Kitabu la Rayba Fi, Hudil lil Muttaqeen. That is the book, he's talking about the book that's with the law, that has no doubt whatsoever in it. It's a source of guidance for those who have taqwa for Allah. They fear Allah. And they do everything for the sake of Allah and don't do things also for the sake of Allah. For instance, they will pray, they will fast, they will give charity, as is mentioned in the same verse. But they will also abstain and stay away from the things they've been ordered not to do because they have the taqwa. But if people don't have taqwa, they'll do anything. Because whoever lies to Allah, or lies about Allah, or lays down instead of doing what Allah ordered them to do, they don't have taqwa. And what do you expect from these people? Huh? Nothing. When I give dawah, you said you're a dai. When I give dawah to anybody, regardless of their belief or lack of it, I don't start by talking about cigarettes, pork, hijab, and lekya, beards. I begin by talking about Allah. Because this is what we're commanded to do in the Quran. And this is what we're commanded to do by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Talk about Allah. How did you get here? Why are you here? What is your purpose in life? How did it all come about? And when they really think about it, they cannot say anything except that it must be something. There must be a God. Unless they're totally irrational. In which case, there's nothing you can do about it. Two things a Muslim has been ordered to do, and two things only, when it comes to this subject of da'wah. One, convey the message in the best way you can. Two, make du'a for them, pray for them, get up in the night and ask Allah to guide them. Other than that, it's out of your hands. Make sense? Jazakallah khair. Do we have a question in the sister section? Yeah. 
Could you please state your name and your occupation and then your question, please? My name is Balanandita. I'm studying. I'm an MBBS student. What is the concept of praying five times a day? Bismillah. If your question is just asking, what is the reason, not the concept, but if you're asking what's the reason for praying five times a day? A Christian has an order in the book of James to pray unceasingly, always, never stop. Pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. Alhamdulillah, we only have to do it five times a day. <laughs> but of course, the concept of prayer in Arabic is not the same as English anyway. We have in English only one word, pray. But in Arabic, as in Aramaic, that's what the Bible came in. The New Testament came in Aramaic, Old Testament Hebrew. The words were really like this. When you say unceasingly, this is called in, in Arabic, adhkar, adhkar. And we make dhikr of Allah unceasingly. But they translate it as pray. Then we have something else. We supplicate and we ask. We raise our hands. Christians go like this. Have you ever seen a Christian pray like this? Which is better, a beggar who is like this with his hands or a beggar like this? I catch a lot more like this, don't you? But anyway, still raising your hands and supplicating. This in Arabic is dua, calling, dua. English, pray. So when we do our ritual where we stand and bow and prostrate, all of this, this is called salah. Salah. Hayya ala salah. Huh? English, pray. So there's the problem. If you would like to know why do we call on God and ask Him, because He's the only one that can help us. If you want to know why do we remember Him in our thinking unceasingly, adhkar, dhikr, this is because we know that He's the only one and we think of Him and we thank Him and we want to be closer to Him. But if you're asking why do we stand and do the ritual that's prescribed in the Quran, that's ordered on the believers, I just answered the question. That's why. Because the rest of the verse that I started a minute ago says like this. I'll just give you the whole thing so you get it. I'll stop there. It says... That is the book wherein there is no doubt. A source of guidance, but only for who? Those who have the righteous consciousness called taqwa, and they believe in the unseen, al-ghaib. They establish the worship that we're talking about, and they pay charity from what Allah gives them. And if somebody's not willing to do that, then the book will not be guidance for them. So if somebody said, well, I read the Quran and I didn't get guided, well, did you follow the instructions? Did you even look at the instructions? Because in order to get guided, taqwa has to be there. If you have taqwa, Allah, he'll guide you. And you'll see the guidance in the Quran. If not, you'll say, it's just a book with a bunch of stuff written on it. I don't know what it is. And I've seen it happen. So if you really care about your Lord, you really want to do what he wants you to do. Maybe you're already on your path to being a Muslim anyway. Because that's what the word Muslim means. Because it comes from the same root as the word Islam. Islam comes from Aslama. Aslama is the verb. Islam is the noun. Whoever does Aslama is a Mu'aslam. Muslim. And what is Islam? Islam is to surrender, submit, obey in sincerity and in peace to the one God. If you believe there's God and you will do this, as a Christian, for instance, they have a clear order from Jesus to pray like this. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
That's the best way to describe it. That's what Islam means. You do what God wants you to do, not what you want to do. And by the way, that's the subject we talked about. You give up what you want for what he wants. And if he tells you to jump on one leg until judgment day, you do it if you believe in him. But if he said, I don't have to do that, you're right back where we started. Remember? Remember? The little boy came in and he said, Mama, I love you. But he can't demonstrate it.